to each one of you this morning. Thank the Lord for this day that we have and the showers we've been receiving and this love and grace that he extends our way. It's just so good to be together with all of you this morning. We have a number of empty seats here today. I know there's some folks that have some things going on in their lives. I think that's are away here today visiting another church. But, uh, there's some sickness going on for some others. Uh, so we just need to continue to keep them in prayer, uplift them before the Lord, and uh, let's just continue to trust the Lord to guide us in this journey of life, and hopefully we all will reach that heavenly home when he calls our name. Can you take your Bible this morning? I'd like to turn back to a portion of Scripture that we began with many, many weeks ago. I'm going to read a couple of verses, and we're going to back up. Well, Ephesians chapter 6, if you would turn there first. I'm going to try to wrap up a series of lessons here that we've been studying. If you recall, we basically began with what we described as true and meaningful worship many weeks ago. In our lives, we need to be prepared for the obstacles and the circumstances and situations of life that are before us. And we've talked about a number of things along with identifying what truth is, identifying what worship is about, trying to identify the significance and the importance of coupling all these things with a prayer life that is meaningful, trying to understand and know when we do pray, how do we know we're making contact? How can we maybe, let's say, carefully, how can we move the heart of God? Does God from time to time change what seemingly was to be a particular event? Let's think of Hezekiah for a moment. Hezekiah was about to die, right? What happened? He repented. Prayers went up. God extended his life, did he not? We talked last week. We talked about a man, a king, named Jehoshaphat. Armies coming against the people of Israel. And Jehoshaphat called for a time of prayer and fasting. Fasting is an important part of our Christian life. And we need to make sure that we can connect to that. But we began these series of studies with something that was very important in Ephesians chapter 6, where we are called to put on something. What are we to put on? We are to put on the whole armor of God. We as believers today need to know that our help is in the Lord. And what we need will come as we call upon Him. And we will see the result. We will see the power, the power of prayer. We talked about power. The power of change. The power of hope. All these things as we travel through these series of lessons. But we're coming back here today in Ephesians chapter 6. I want to read a few words from this text, beginning with verse 10. Finally. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Paul writes in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Again, Paul writes, verse 13, Wherefore, take upon you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand, stand. Therefore, I'm going to stop there. Stand. Have you ever faced opposition of some kind? Have you ever faced a problem? 
difficult problem? We've all been there. Things happen. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, correct? I'm going to share something. You may think this is story time. But there's a man and his wife that went into business. In fact, I'll just read the article and I'll let you hear what's going on. 1974 was one of those trial of your faith workers patience expressions for Sharon and I. His name's Tracy. We were living in Apple Valley, California, California, and I had entered into a partnership with an old friend building swimming pools in the high desert. Things seemed to be going well. Sales were terrific. Customers were satisfied. We were actually floating on air. Then came the end of the building season. We had nothing to worry about. We had a half a dozen pools under construction, a bank account full of money, plenty, we thought, to get us through the winter of e with ease. Sharon and I had started a gospel group with another couple, June and Dale Wade. We had a pretty fair country gospel sound. We were named the Country Congregation. I wrote most of the music for the group and secured a record contract with Calvary Records in Nashville. While the group was developing, I noticed something disturbing in our pool business. The bookkeeper kept telling us to spend more money, but our bank account was shrinking faster than our pools were finishing. The wholesale price index was increasing rapidly with inflation. My partner kept increasing prices to compensate for cost increases, but something was not right. I approached him on the matter. He was completely frustrated with the whole situation, and I realized he had hit the wall of burnout. He handed me all the books and the contracts and said, here, you figure it out. I closed myself in the office for the weekend, went over every figure, laid out all of my spreadsheets. The figures looked bad. I calculated that when all the construction was finished, we would be $22,000 in the hole and I couldn't believe it. My partner threw his hands up. I'm tired, I'm frustrated. Let's bank go bankrupt, he said. I didn't feel that was the right thing to do. All right then, if you want to try to save it, be my guest. You can have it all. He drew up the paperwork, turned everything over to me. Office equipment, truck, his car, and a $22,000 deficit. Sharon and I prayed. Boy, did we pray. We, what could we do now? We, we'd be six months until we'd be back into the building season. <coughs> the building season returned. I had pools to complete, had no money to do it with. God help us. We didn't have much, but what little we had, I used to buy into this seemingly wonderful business. But now, what do I have? In the midst of turmoil, I was awakened from a troubled sleep one night. It was about two o'clock in the morning. I, a tune was echoing in my brain. I picked up a tablet and a pencil and I began to write. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain and you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But when things change and you're down in the valley, don't lose faith. You're never alone. I want to play something for you. Life is easy when we're on the mountain, right? But what about when we're in that valley? What do we do? You know, most of us are probably like this man's partner. I quit. I can't go anymore. I'm done. But how many of us would commit ourselves to prayer, to come before God, 
and say, help me. And be able to receive that help through the words of a song that became a very well-received song that actually made its way to number one on many charts. When things go wrong, he'll make it right. In all, this particular song took about 30 minutes. And Tracy said, again, I prayed, thank you, Lord. And he settled back and fell asleep. Morning came, breakfast and prayer time. Lord, show us your will. I went off to work. Shortly after I arrived at the office, the phone rang. Mr. Dart, that was his last name, Tracy Dart. Mr. Dart, could you please help us? I grabbed my briefcase and went to see the people who had called me. Their son was a gifted athlete, but had a motorcycle accident and was paralyzed from the waist down. You gotta think about Ken's nephew. His doctor had recommended a swimming pool for his therapy, and this young man needed in order for him to be able to walk again. I began to process, to design, and to prepare to build this pool. A few days later, another call, Mr. Dart, could you come talk to me about a pool? So through the off season, we ended up selling 12 new swimming pools. At a time when no one else was building pools, the building season came and all of a sudden we were able to finish all of our construction and eliminate all our debt. We were free and clear without having to go bankrupt. God had taken us through the valley. Church, we face things at times that we just don't understand. We cry out to God at times. We talked about that. How can we move the heart of God? You know, sometimes it's not God that needs to change. It's us that needs to change. You know, when we go into a time of prayer and fasting, obviously it allows us to focus more on God and disconnect from the things of the world. If you just keep your eyes on the things of this world, you're going to go crazy. Because there's a not, there's just not a lot of good out there right now. To share another story. Like I said, you're gonna think this is story time. The power of prayer. This goes along with our text here today. While crossing the Atlantic on a ship many years ago, Bible teacher and author F.B. Meyer was asked to speak to the passengers. An agnostic listened to Meyer's message about answered prayer and told a friend, I don't believe a word of it. Later that same day, the agnostic went to hear Meyer speak to another group of passengers. You would think the guy, if he didn't believe it the first time, he wasn't going to go back the second time. You know, sometimes people need to hear it again, right? But before he went to the meeting, he put two oranges in his pocket. On his way, he passed an elderly woman who was fast asleep on her deck chair. Her arms were outstretched, her hands were wide open. So as a joke, he put the two oranges in each of her palms. After the meeting, he saw the woman happily eating one of the pieces of fruit. You seem to be enjoying that orange, he remarked with a smile. Yes, sir, she replied. My father is very good to me. What do you mean? Pressed the agnostic. She exclaimed, I have been seasick for days. I was asking God somehow to send me an orange. I fell asleep while I was praying. When I awoke, I found he had sent me not only one, but two oranges. The agnostic was amazed by this unexpected confirmation of Meyer's talk on answered prayer. Later, this man 
put his trust in Christ. What is it going to take to get some folks across the finish line? What is it going to take to turn our country around? You know, if we were to look at situations on just the surface, we would say there's no hope. There's no hope for us as a nation. But we need to keep our eye on the one who has all things in his control. You know, sometimes things get out of sight, get out of our sight. We can't see. Where is God? Why isn't God working? Why is it this happening? Why aren't these things being done? What could I do? Maybe could I do different that would help move God along? Can I share another story? You okay? Don't throw me out. In the ancient sport of falconry, used train hawks or falcons in the pursuit of wild game. When an educated predator finally becomes to the, comes to the place that they are allowed to fly, however, sometimes they end up rising too high for the human eye to see. So a hunter <coughs> often carries a small bird in a cage called a shrike. By watching the antics of this little bird, the man could always tell where his hawk was. For the shrike instantly feared the predator and cocked its head to keep it in view. I want you to think about something. As Christians, we desperately need to be alert and we need to have the perception similar to this, this little bird that we might be able to detect the spiritual enemy. Our adversary Who's our adversary? The devil. the devil. Satan himself. He walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 8. We have those words spoken to us. Our responsibility is, according to the Apostle Peter, to be sober, to be vigilant. In other words, we are to always be on alert. But are we as alert as we should be? Are we as awake as we should be? It would be nice if God would put up a siren to warn us when the enemy's about ready to attack. But that doesn't happen. It does not happen. He doesn't operate that way. But what he does call us to is to be reading his word regularly. He calls us to be people that meditate upon these truths. He calls us to times of prayerful attitudes. And he calls us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, we're not immune to problems in this world. The devil's clever. And he's deceiving a lot of people today. He's cunning. And he causes many to fall. And sometimes, some of those in our eyes, we might think they were 
They were strong Christian people, but they fell. Look at how many ministries throughout the years have fallen victim to the enemy's attacks. You know, if the enemy gets in, if he gets a foothold, he's going to tear things apart. But as a church, as a people, as individuals, we truly need to be upon our knees crying out to God. We need to be hearing God through His Spirit. The devil's sly. And he will surely try to confuse and distract us from the things of God. Maybe we need that little bird to keep our attention, to know that the enemy is coming. Maybe we need to be more attentive to God's warnings. 1 John 4, 4 says, He who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Do we believe that today? Do we believe that the Spirit of God that needs to be in every one of us is greater than that enemy that is trying to destroy us right now? God is so good. God is so good. Ephesians 6, 13, Wherefore, Take upon you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, verse 14 says what at the beginning? Stand. Stand therefore, stand firm, stand strong. Having your loins girt about with truth. Do we know the truth of God today? Is this book in your mind, is it truth? Yes. We need to have the armor, the truth of God wrapped around us, in us. It should be spoken in our words. A knowledge of all that God's word has to say. Probably most of us don't have a lot of God's word committed to memory, but we should be able to share some. There was a pastor by the name of Jack Van Impey. Anybody remember Jack Van Impey? What was he known for? He was called what? He was actually called the walking Bible. He had everything committed to memory. Could you imagine? You would not have an excuse if you stood before God, would you? Church, we don't have an excuse now. We have enough understanding of God's truth that when it comes to sin, we're guilty. We're guilty. That truth needs to be in us. It's part of God's armor. It's what we need today. But he goes on, and he says, having on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, in our studies throughout these past weeks, we've talked about truth, but we've also talked about righteousness. Righteousness means what, scripturally speaking? Right living. That's what it means. Righteousness means right living. Now, I've heard people say, well, what seems right for you may not be right for me. Is that an excuse? No. Does that work for God? <laughs> Sorry, it's not going to stand. It needs to be God's. Word. It needs to be His truth. We need to have on that breastplate of righteousness. You, it might be read this way. We need to have the breastplate which is righteousness. 
When we live among our families and our fellow man, are we living what we would call a right way of life? You know, there's people doing a lot of things out there that, out in the world today that they are think that they think they are doing under the cover of darkness. You know, I'm not talking about just nighttime. They think they're doing it in a manner well, nobody's ever going to find this out. Our lives needs to be lives that demonstrate right living. Verse 15. And your feet need to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, in Scripture, you know, we find many times when Jesus came into a, a home or something, he bid them peace. How many of us speak to each other in those kind of words? Peace be it to you. Peace be upon you. Peace be with you. You know, if there was ever a day and age which we needed some sense of peace, it's today, right? And I'm not talking about just peace from war. I'm talking about emotional peace. People are dealing with things emotionally that is most troubling. Preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, we can be excited about this because when we really tap into the truth of God, when we walk in the righteousness of God, we can truly experience the full peace of God. What's Jesus' words in John 14? Is it verse 27? My peace. Anyone? I leave with you. Okay. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world knows peace. And we're not talking about world peace. We're talking about the peace of Jesus Christ. Well, it goes on. Above all things, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Have you ever been shot at? <laughs> well, maybe I should ask Rod. <laughs> Rod was telling a story about it. BB guns one time. I'm not, I'm not talking about that kind of shot. It just sort of went that way. I'm talking about shot at by the enemy, the devil. Have you ever been hit by any of his attacks? We all. Have. And it seems when he gets you to that point, he just tramps all over you. Have you ever had the devil bring up your past? <laughs> he, he tries to play that card a lot, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. You're not worthy of that. Look what you did. Look at this person. Yep. You did this too. He wants to point out all your faults. What's Carmen say, Zach? When the devil brings up your past, we bring up his future. <laughs> We need to bring up the devil's future. It doesn't look good for him, does it? If you know your Bible, you know what's awaiting him. But as a believer of Jesus Christ, if we have done all to stand, if we have done everything we can do, if we are putting our hope, our trust, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we can stand strong. You know, the Bible tells us if we resist the devil, he will what? Flee. He will flee. We don't have to fret. We don't have to worry. What we need to do is keep our focus. Be that little bird. Let everyone know the enemy's coming. Keep your eye on him. But 
that you don't have to worry about it because you know where he's at. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We need to have those things that protect us, provide for us. You know, verse 16 talked about that shield of faith that we need to have. Taking God, taking God in his word. The helmet of salvation helps keep it, if you will, where it needs to be. Protecting us. Our hope. What's Hebrews 11.1 1 say? Faith. Faith is the hope for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Do you have faith today that's strong? But it goes on. It says the what? Evidence. The evidence of things unseen. not seen. You know, we don't see, spiritually speaking, we don't see everything, do we? But confirmation through Jesus Christ, through the Spirit in our hearts, lets us know that through our faith, through the substance of hope that we have, and I'm not just talking about wishful thinking, we can know because we know because we know. know. We have that assurance. We have that promise. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, our hope, our hope, you know, we could take that, I don't know what translation everyone has in here, but there's Bible translation that says certainty. We can have certainty in what's going on here. Certainty of what? What do we have certainty of today, Christians? Victory. Salvation, victory, our hope in Jesus Christ. It's yours. It's ours. The world can't take it away. Believe it or not, guess who else can't take it away? The devil can't take it away from you. What's verse 18 say? Someone want to read verse 18 for me? I'm getting tired. I've read too many stories. <laughs> Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Wow! Do you know there is a lot packed into that one verse? Amen. There is a lot packed in there. What we are seeing here is the very help and hope that every one of us needs. Praying, how often? Always. Praying always with all prayer, with all supplication. In what? Spirit. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? You know, we've come a lot of weeks studying a lot of things. We know that when we receive Jesus Christ, immediately there's something takes place in your life that changes you. You know, we talked one or two weeks in and around the Holy Spirit and the communication with our spirit and what needs to happen in our lives. The more we are in tune with the Holy Spirit, the more our innermost being, the communication between the Holy Spirit and our spirit has to take place. We have to be able to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. But when our spirit begins to transfer 
that information to our innermost being, our, we would call it our soul, we become a new and transformed person. Amen. That's necessary. We need to hear from God. We need to hear His Spirit. We need to allow our spirit to communicate with His Spirit that we can be transformed and be what He calls us to be. Yeah, that song, He's Still Working on Me, that's still going on for all of us, whether you know it or not. Not just me. All of us. He's working on us. That very Word of God, you know, if we were to back up here and, and look at the sword of the Spirit again, the very Word of God is what needs to be communicated into our lives. That Logos, that Word, we need to hear. God's Word for you. You know, the story we read here of this man who was basically at the end of wit's end, the business that looked like it was going belly up, being awakened in the middle of the night to hear from God. How many of us are that attentive to the things of God that when God wants to wake us up, how many of us like 2 o'clock in the morning? Depends on what you think of God. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 I have. I have been awakened many times, early morning hours, because God's speaking. I haven't written songs. Don't get me wrong. I haven't done that. But we need to be attentive to what God communicates. You know, there's a lot of stories about mothers in, in wars past, whether it be the Korean War, World War II, World War I, where moms were prompted at a critical time to pray for their son or their daughter in conflict, only to find out later that the exact time mom was prompted to pray, something horrific was taking place in the lives of their child. And God brought them through it. How important is prayer? How important is obedience? You know, as I read this one story, yeah, if God would blare a silent siren saying the enemy's coming, then we would know, right? But we need to be so in tune to the things of God that we hear from God. There are situations that all of us go through that when we are trusting God, there can be a check brought in our spirit to protect us. Church, we need to be that close, that sensitive to know that this is of God. Praying always with all prayer supplication in the spirit. Watching there with all perseverance and supplication. For all saints. Do you realize we should be watching out for each other? Amen. Church, we need to collectively be praying for one another that we be protected. <coughs> because the enemy, if he gets in, he can destroy it all. I don't want him in here. I don't want the enemy coming in and deceiving his people. Verse 19. And for me, the utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul was making it clear that he wanted all that God had to give. How about you? You know, if you go to the bank and you go to the teller and you have them open your bank account and tell you how much is there. And you say, well, I want to withdraw that. And they might say to you, all of it. Do you let any there for them? If you're withdrawing your bank account, you want what? All. I want all of it. Do you want all of what God has to give you? 
I don't think we've received it. In fact, I know we have not received it all. Do you want more of God? Do you want more of the Lord? Amen. Do you want to walk closer to Him in the Spirit? Do you remember these? <laughs> What's in here? Salt, salt, salt and sugar. Salt and sugar. <laughs> Which do you want to be? Salt. <laughs> salt. You know, sugar's tempting, isn't it? Goes down well. But we need to be the salt. We need to have more of what God wants to pour out upon us. How many of you have a funnel around the house? Funnel? You got a funnel? Yes. What do you use it for? A funnel. I know. <laughs> Fill up salt shakers. Okay, thanks, Dee. You know, if, if you're trying to pour something, salt, into a salt shaker. Cindy uses one to do the same thing. You use a funnel. Because it starts to narrow that down that it flows easily in. You know, as Christians, you know what we can be. Would you like to be a funnel? How can you be a funnel? You want to be a funnel? Just stand again. I want you to be a funnel this morning. If you feel uncomfortable, that's okay. I understand, but I want you to be a funnel. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead. equipping us, giving us all we need to stand strong in the faith. Lord, let us not waver. Let us not look to the right or the left. Let us keep our eyes fixed upon the prize that is before us. Truly, our hope is in you. And Lord, we give you the praise. Go with your people in this up and coming week. And I pray, Father, that the glory of all that you are will be seen. The words will be edifying and encouraging, bring healing and strengthening, bringing restoration to all who are in need. We give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' most precious name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless.